Thank you. Um, welcome. This is the Education Committee and the Vermont House of Representatives, as well as the Commerce and Economic Development uh, Committee in the House of Representatives. And we are meeting here on Thursday, February 17th, and are delighted to have uh, representatives from the Education Commission of the States who are help, going to be helping us a little bit to understand uh, how other states are addressing their, their um, uh, career and tech governance and funding. So with that, what Representative Marcotte, you can just wave your hand so they'll see you. He will, we are each going to be um, watching for questions within our, our rooms and, and we'll let you know. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to welcome Tom Kelly and Aaron Piquini. And I guess we're going to start with Tom. So for the record, could you introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm uh, Tom Kiley, Education Commission of the States, based in Denver, Colorado. So wonderful. And, and thank you, Chair Webb. And thank you, Chair Mascot, for uh, the invitation to uh, join you this morning. Members of the committee, I'm happy to be with you. Um, my name is Tom Kiley, as I said. I'm from the Education Commission of the States, uh, based in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> This afternoon, I will share information on state approaches to funding career and technical education. So uh, as the chair mentioned, I am joined this morning by my colleague, Aaron Mowinney. Aaron is the state relations director at Education Commission of the States and serves as the liaison to um, Vermont. And it can be a great point of contact for any questions you may have to, after our session today or in the future as you think of education policy questions that come up in your work. So before I dive into the content of the presentation, I'd like to share a roadmap for, where, of the, for the information I'll share with you over the next 15 minutes or so. Today's presentation is intended to provide a broad overview of the topic of funding secondary career and technical education. There is considerable nuance when examining funding models for CTE in a state. This presentation will provide a high level overview of the topic across all 50 states. I will share briefly an introduction of the Education Commission of the States and how we support education policy makers. I will start by briefly introducing us uh, as an organization. I'll follow that by um, briefly talking about how states are offering CT instruction across the states. Next, I will share some high level information on the approaches states take to fund secondary CTE, as well as some advantages and challenges with those models. Lastly, and at the chair's discretion, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have based on what we share. Um, and also, we're always happy to dig deeper into questions, provide additional research that supports you and your work as you think about CTE funding and other education policy issues. So Education Commission of the States is a nonpartisan organization that supports education policymakers on issues ranging from pre-K through post-secondary and workforce development. We provide unbiased information and nonpartisan information through a series of services, including research through our and reports and counsel, like the presentation I'm giving today, and through our convenings where we bring education policymakers together to learn with and from each other. We are here to support you in your work and provide unbiased and nonpartisan information that can help you make informed education policy decisions. Before I share information of different funding approaches for CTE, it's important to note where CTE instruction is offered in states. When considering funding models, there are a range of considerations and implications, including the method and location of delivery of CTE instruction. Generally speaking, there are three educational settings where CTE is offered to students in high schools, post-secondary institutions, and area CTE centers. Many states use a combination of these settings to provide CT instruction for secondary students. As such, states may draw on and use a range of funding sources and mechanisms to support delivery across instructional setting. So when we think of area CTE centers across the states, there are at least 34 states that operate CTE centers. Often CTE centers offer instruction to high school students, in some cases, adults and post-secondary students. In many states, area CTE centers are part of a system of CTE in instruction. Often, state CTE centers offer instruction to 
at CT centers, but also in other settings such as high school and post-secondary institutions. Given the type of instruction and students serve, states may draw on different funding sources and take different approaches to funding the centers in their state. Now that we have a general sense of where secondary CT is delivered in states, I'd like to provide a brief overview of state approaches for funding secondary CTE. This overview will pro provide some broad classifications of and approaches. Tom, I just, I just, you, you are, um, you're, you're on your, um, your PowerPoint as well yeah, here. Right. Yeah, so I, I'm on the sure presentation. <laughs> Can you turn up the volume just a little bit? Can, Can we turn up the volume? Please, yeah. Yeah, my apologies. I've been having some microphones <laughs> and video issues. So, does uh, that sound any better? Yes, that's good. Okay. Um, and yes, I'm on the green slide, uh, which I think uh, has like a little pig with books on it. Um, yes. So as we transition out, um, just moving from the map that had the orange color, or excuse me, the purple colored states, um, which represent um, area CTE centers. Um, so as we go through some of these approaches, I'll share some advantages uh, and challenges for your, for your consideration as well. Um, these advantages and challenges are drawn on research on various K-12 funding approaches and are documented and known uh, advantages and challenges within the research space for K-12 funding. Uh, it should be noted that the broad classification shared involves significant nuance in how they play out with state CTE funding models. The classifications are intended to provide a basic frame of, a, of how states approach funding CTE instruction for secondary students. Following the presentation, we'd be happy to provide additional information on the models as well as state examples as it's helpful to your work here in Vermont. So transitioning now, you should see a slide with um, our Mardi Gras colors of orange, green, purple, uh, and gray uh, before you that says secondary CT funding approaches. So in 2019, ECS conducted an analysis of secondary CT <laughs> policy across all 50 states. As part of that analysis, we looked at state, how states provide funds to schools and districts for secondary CT instruction. Based on our analysis, we identified four general approaches, unit-based, student-based, cost-based, and funding for CTE centers. It is also important to note that there are a few states that fall outside of these general classifications. Those are represented and noted in light gray on the map before you. As you can see in the map, the approaches range across the states. There are a range of factors that may influence and direct the approach that states take to fund CTE. Next, I'll provide some descriptions of each approach as well as some advantages and challenges. So the student-based funding approach, so turning now to the green left-hand side, green slide with a little student on the left, um, the student-based funding approach is where states distribute funds to districts based on the number of CTE students enrolled in a local education agency. The calculation for the number of CTE students enrolled may vary. In some instances, this is based on the average daily membership calculation as defined in the state school funding formula. The student-based approach has at least three notable advantages. First of which is transparency. The approach may provide an optimal funding system that has clear and easily understood rules for where, how, and why dollars flow. Another notable advantage is flexibility. Districts have autonomy in spending choices. In the student-based model, funds are allocated to CT based on the number of CTE students not on the resources uh, provided, or re excuse me, resources necessary to provide that instruction. This allows districts to choose where to invest those funds as opposed to being directed on the expenditure necessary. And the last advantage being portability. Money flows based on the number of students. In the student-based model, funding increases and decreases as students enroll. Student CT enrollment changes over time. A notable challenge of the student-based approach is oversight. So oversight meaning that there may be a need to establish processes to ensure funds are used appropriately. In a student-based model, state may develop uh, reporting or accountability measures to ensure funds are used appropriately since the local districts have spending autonomy under this model. 
a unit-based approach, so turning to our orange slides, um, a unit-based approach is one where the state distributes funds based on a set of educational inputs used to deliver CT instruction. Educational inputs could include the number of instructors or administrators employed by a local agency or the equipment used to provide CT instruction. There are two notable advantages with a unit-based approach, the first of which is oversight. In a resource-based model, the state can direct resources for established policy goals, such as staffing levels or equipment necessary to provide instruction. The second of which is uniformity. So the resource-based model focuses on providing consistency in staffing and resources across schools and districts. A notable challenge with the unit-based model is rigidity. The model may create rigidity or less flexibility at the local level. These models can restrict local spending decisions and, the, and schools in different geographic areas of the state may require different services or have different costs, such as recruitment and retention of teachers or transportation costs. Turning now to our gray slide of cost-based. So a cost-based approach is one where the state distributes funds to districts for the cost of providing CTE services. Often states cap or limit the rate of reimbursement, meaning that only a portion of the local education agency's expenditures may be covered. There are two notable advantages to this model. The model uh, can provide an opportunity for financial tracking expenses are reported by the district to the state. This allows greater level of financial tracking at the state level. Second, the model can protect districts against significant cost liabilities. The state can assist districts in providing for excess costs for programs and CT instruction. There are also two notable challenges. The model may introduce some administrative complexity the process of reporting costs can be time consuming for both the state and the local administrators. Further, the model may necessitate spending limits. States may reimburse a portion of the expenses, cap the spending at certain levels, or prorate funds if appropriated levels are insufficient. And lastly, this, turning, oops, was there a question? This is, this is the bucket that you put, Vermont fell into this bucket. Correct. Yeah, correct. Uh, as a primary source for um, CT centers, given the structure within your state. Um, so turning to our purple slides on funding for CT centers, uh, funding for CT centers is where states distribute funds to districts to use to support CT centers. In this approach, there is generally some determined tuition, cost, tuition or cost for instruction at the CT center, and the districts use the state and in some cases local funds to pay the tuition and other costs for the student from their district. CTE centers may have separate appropriations through the state budget to support administrative costs and other costs of running a centralized center. With the funding for CTE centers approach, there are a few advantages. So economies of scale can be created through the use of funding for CTE centers approach. Centers can draw from multiple districts, which make offering CTE more cost efficient. Through this model, school districts consolidate similar courses and related facilities and equipment costs in one location. An additional benefit is related to sharing costs for staffing. Centers allow participating districts to share the cost of providing specialized instruction for specific services and types of programs. For example, CTE centers may offer, say, welding courses or advanced manufacturing courses um, that appeal to a limited number of students and have notable shortages in terms of instructors. By drawing across districts, CTE centers can pool students and instructors to provide specialized coursework more efficiently. There are also a couple of potential challenges with this model. One of it is one of which is logistic complexities, such as transportation which may deter districts from participating in CT centers and may require additional state and local appropriations. There may be also issues associated with cost sharing. Participating schools or districts may need to negotiate cost sharing agreements. Voluntary agreements, which, where a key contributor withdraws, can threaten the long-term financial viability of the CT center. 
So we'll so I'm turning now to a green slide uh, that says additional funding sources for secondary CTE. While there's models, while these models are used across the states to distribute funds for CTE instruction, there are a range of other funding sources that states may use to support secondary CTE in their state. Notably, federal Perkins funds um, are granted from the state to districts um, to support CT instruction at the secondary level, as well as other types of instruction, as, as I'm sure you well know. Um, states also consider uh, grants to support the expansion of, and development of CT programs in their state. These funds may help offset costs for developing instruction and providing that instruction to students. There are also local funds that districts may draw on to support CT instruction in their district. And lastly, some states are making appropriations outside of the general school funding process to address specific costs of offering CTE. Some common areas where we see states concentrating these funds and appropriations is around uh, supporting transportation, uh, CTE teacher training, and CTE teacher recruitment and retention. To conclude the presentation, so turning to an orange slide with a person with a thought bubble about them, um, to conclude the presentation, I would like to share some general thoughts uh, for your consideration around funding CTE in your state. These considerations can be applied to CTE, but also apply more broadly to K-12 funding. These considerations are drawn from review of research on K-12 finance um, in the United States. So turning now to student and school attributes. School finance systems typically account for variance in geographic factors and student demographics across districts in the state. All states have differing numbers of rural and urban districts, wealthy and low income districts, uh, concentrations of student uh, English language learners or special education students or CTE students. When designing school finance systems, states may allocate additional funds to account for, different, for the differences in costs um, for specific student populations. For example, districts with a high concentration of multiple types of special student populations, like CTE students or English language learners, uh, would likely require additional state support to provide an education aligned to the state's definition and standards. States face ongoing challenges to determine and fund the appropriate adjustments for different student populations and other factors that go into providing education, especially as the needs of students and education goals evolve within states, schools, and districts. And lastly, turning to cost factors. There are many cost factors related to education funding, including school personnel, facilities, maintenance and operation, administration, transportation, instructional materials, and technology. Not all cost factors are accounted for in the state aid for schools. States may have different funding systems or revenue streams for expenditures such as capital outlays or transportation. And as our time together uh, nears an end, we'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to present this information to you this morning. And as I mentioned throughout, we'd be happy to provide additional information and detailed examples uh, in written response for you uh, and for your review. Um, Aaron's contact information as well as mine is provided on the thank you slide in your slide deck. Um, and at the chair's discretion, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. I just have one question first from, from me, and, and that is uh, in relation to other states experiencing declining enrollment. Is that something that we are not, are we the only state that's struggling with this, or, or how prevalent is that for other CTE centers? Um, thank you for the question. Um, and no, I don't think you're unique in that. Um, you know, dec declining enrollments, I think that's something we've seen across states. And I think it's also an issue within funding systems that some of our staff are really looking into in terms of how, how does that impact state funding for, for schools and students you know, at the local level. So we're happy to provide additional information on that, kind of, of how states are addressing that following the presentation. But uh, to answer your question, no, I don't think that's necessarily unique to Vermont. Um, Representative James has a question for you. I have three questions. Yes. Three questions. <laughs> One at a time. One at a time. Okay, this is probably a, a simple question. Um, 
Can you help me understand why we're not a student-based system since we pay we pay uh, the CTE centers tuition based on enrollment? So I think that's actually point out a really important nuance within the models that I presented. So multiple approaches can go. I think the way we classified things in our research was on the end output. So yes, you're correct in Vermont. That is exactly how it happens. And that's that also transpires in other states. So kind of to my point about states using different models and different approaches, I think that is common right across all 50 states where we see combinations of these classifications. And I think the you know, what I was hoping to provide through the classifications was kind of a very base primary uh, funding mechanism or approach that also incorporates other pieces. So yes, um, a long way of saying yes, that's correct. And yes, that is common across states as well. Just, just to follow up, to, so I, I'm sure I'm understanding this first question. So you said we kind of have a combo system but you classified us based on sort of the final outcome. Could you just explain what you meant by that? Yeah, so in, so just kind of for context around how we often conduct our 50 state comparisons is we try to distill things to you know comparable identifiers. So I think that's why we have Vermont as funding for CTE centers because it's a primary base for your instruction as well. So I think that's why we identified Vermont that way that yes, there is nuance under that as well, which is also correct. But that's you know our determination within our research approach and our methodology for that research. You had, you had more, I said. Huh? You have more questions, right? Well, I, I don't want to hog that. I'm sure there are other questions. Okay, I'm looking just to see, um, uh, Chair Marcotte, just if you have anybody in your room before we go back to our room. <laughs> I think Representative Roche has a question. Just, just uh, following up on the questions that we just asked. So, uh, could you give us any idea what the criteria in the model uh, is that would cause Vermont to be classified in the group that it's in? Certainly. So, I think it was in that in the instance of states that have CT centers, mm -hmm. when we made determinations of the model identifier, it was informed by the primary basis of instruction as well. So kind of that first section I walked through of the different places where instructions is provided, we pulled that information in to inform our ultimate end decision. So that I hope that answers your question in terms of our methodology of how we got to that final identifier. Representative Brady in our room has a question. Uh, thank you. So if Vermont is, is sort of a hybrid of the student-based and the cost-based, um, the challenge I think we're really seeking to address is that our system does not, um, it, it creates a disincentive uh, for schools to send students to CTE because it has our schools sort of competing against each other for funds in a sense. And I don't see that necessarily as a disadvantage of either of those. So I'm trying to understand how that challenge we have fits into this model you've, or th this paradigm you've provided or, and what some of the solutions might be or some of the ways that other states do things so that it isn't a kind of a disincentive to send a student to a CTE. <laughs> yes, I think that's an interesting point you raise. Um, when thinking about it too, so you know, I, it, in the kind of advantages slide, I talked about the cost sharing, some of the cost sharing challenges associated with funding for CTE centers, regardless of you know how the money gets there, but for funding CTE centers and instruction through that, um, you know, some states have approached that through. Uh, cost sharing agreements and the structure of those. So how that's, so maybe providing um, less friction to get to the um, the entry or support up, right? So not disincentivizing sending students. And then also too, I think there's um, other costs associated with sending a student too, right? Such as transportation, um, you know, materials and how that impacts both the sending district and the CTE center, I think is also another consideration to keep in mind and I think some states have either done that through adjusting appropriations through the mechanisms they have to distribute funds or through additional appropriations for, you know, I think on the green slide, talking about transportation or costs for 
instructional services like teacher salaries, et cetera, at the centers uh, to support that. And I think also to thinking of CT centers, the many different sources of funds, both state and federal, that can be used to support CT centers, given the diversity of the instruction that's provided at them. So kind of addressing some of those administrative costs or instructional costs by bringing in those, those additional funding sources. Are there states that you would identify as doing a particularly good job um, in terms of their successes with career in tech? So I think those questions are, you know, we're always happy to provide state examples uh, of states, but I think, you know, when we think about offering CT instruction, there's a multitude of inputs that different states have. So I think kind of as a foundational piece, understanding kind of the goals, purpose, and intentions behind CTE in Vermont, and we're working from there to provide funding sources to support those, you know, is kind of a, a starting point. Because, you know, as we look at it, we can look at different models and see different outcomes, but often, oftentimes there's inputs within the state. So, you know, thinking of folks at your state department of ed and those that are administrating CTE programs through the centers um, may provide deeper insight into kind of those answers, which then may provide us with the opportunity then to provide examples to you all of states that have similar inputs and we can provide kind of different uh, information on that. But I, I hesitate to say that, you know, one state is doing it better than another because of the range of inputs that go into providing CT instruction in states and then the mechanisms that states have at their disposal to fund those, those goals and purposes of CT instruction in their state. And the common, and then uh, just two things. Uh, first of all, when it comes to trying to categorize us with funding, it's very challenging in that we've got three different CTE types. We've got a private, public independent, and then those whose budgets are wholly within their home school district, and then, but then receive a lot of tuition money from sending high school. So it's very hard, I think, to really say it is this model versus another. I think you've done your best, the best you could with what we have to work with. Um, but off of funding, I guess, could you um, talk about uh, sort of the comparison? I know some states have full CTE high schools, uh, whereas Vermont, is it's really a separate and apart from the high school education and advantages, disadvantages there. Absolutely, sorry, was, my mouse was elusive at the moment. Um, and I think you raise a very good point about, you know, the broad classifications again. Um, you know, multiple classifications going to support in CTE in many states. Um, one state that comes to mind kind of around the uh, CTE kind of high school model or, or collection of, of districts is in Ohio. So Ohio has a system set up where um, multiple districts functionally pool resources, support uh, CTE specific high school, um, which you know technically is classified as a CT center. So um, they have a model of that and they also have models for uh, cost sharing associated with that. So where there's the pooling of funds to support that. So that's one state that has kind of a CT center-ish model, right? They also have instruction at CT at high schools in CT and they also rely on post-secondary institutions to provide some um, CT instruction through dual enrollment. But they are one state where the um, funding mechanism helps support the pooling of funds um, and kind of really thinking of those economies at the point I raised about economies of scale um, is one state that really has done that uh, through their CT construction and then also supported that through their, their funding approach. Representative Mulvaney. Representative Marcotte, your room. Yes. Representative Mulvaney Stanek has a question. Thank you, Representative Marcotte. Um, I'm curious if, because it seems in the, the map of how the different um, configurations other states have done, I'm particularly curious for like, like structured states in, in the sense that we're very rural, we have a small population um, and the trends we have. So I'm just curious if, because there seems to be different, we have a similar model, at least not by our map to New York and California. There are also a couple other ones, but I look to Maine, I look to Montana, just in terms of size scale that would have transportation issues, you know, the, the cost, um, to operate uh, CTEs with small population, et cetera. So I'm just wondering if you cross cross cut the data in that kind of way in any in any way, shape, or form, and looked at more of like what do rural states tend to do? And I guess my follow would be: Are any other rural states also looking at this currently and thinking about a new way of going about it? Who have again similar demographic loss, you know, in terms of our our population. 
Um, absolutely, and, and thank you for the question. Um, and I think, yeah, so we have, you know, kind of thought about that on the back end, right, of looking at kind of the, the spectrum of our, um, our information that we gathered. And I think it may be interesting to uh, look at New Hampshire and Maine in your instance of kind of the rural states, kind of Northeast. I think they're maybe de dealing with some similar demographic concerns as well um, and ways to kind of support students in uh, education and training more broadly through CTE as part of a broader kind of workforce education and training system in our state. So um, I think Maine, you know, there's some information that we've gotten that they're considering uh, their funding approaches for CTE and their structure and how to maximize that as part of kind of this broader workforce education and training system. Um, and New Hampshire having a similar model. Massachusetts could also be an interesting state, um, you know, not necessarily from the rural aspect, but of um, kind of the structure of you know, urban versus rural uh, comparisons there. Um, but we would be happy to provide you know, some follow up on kind of any particular states or states that we kind of identify as having larger rural population. Mm -hmm. And breaking down some of that information of you know, structure in terms of where CT is offered, but also how they're funding uh, and using different funding models and approaches to support those you know, rural students. Um, I think transportation is a common theme that we hear in states with high uh, concentration of rural schools and districts. Um, so we'd be happy to even provide some information on how transportation is considered in that or not considered in those calculations. Representative James in our room. Yeah, it's more of a program delivery question. So I'm not sure if that's outside the, the scope of our conversation today. Go ahead. You want to just give it a shot? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, one of the things that we're considering or that has been proposed um, is a pilot program whereby students enrolled at a, one of our regional CTE centers would take their non-CTE classwork, you know, their, their quote unquote academic classes um, online through an organization we have called the Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative or Collaborative, Cooperative. And I was just wondering if you um, know of any other states that have a model like that and, and how it's working. Um, it's a very good question. Um, I don't have any states off the top of my head. Um, but I'm happy to follow up with some examples because you know I've heard, within the space I've heard conversations about those approaches, but um, don't have any specific states right off the top of my head. So, but we're happy to follow up and provide some information on that. Thank you. One of the things that we've looked at is is opening up our CTEs to younger students, for example, access in middle schools and other states that are using such a, a, an approach. So yes, I think there's a lot of states that are considering CTE you know, in middle school and kind of also considering like what are some kind of career based models to help support students kind of throughout K-12 education, um, you know, and transitioning into post-secondary education or specific job training and support. Um, Maryland could be an interesting state to uh, look at considering some of their um, work around like a career continuum that they've and how they're thinking about that through CTE and work-based learning um, starting in middle school. Um, and they even have some pieces that are thinking about how the state is supporting literacy and, and math development in the K-12 grades and how that translates and supports students into that transition into CTE and exploration uh, through work-based learning and CTE courses. So Maryland could be an interesting state to look at um, around that model and approach. Um, and also are thinking about some innovative ways to fund that model too. Representative Jerome has a question. Thank you, Tom. I uh, My question is sort of on the other end of that. We've also uh, had conversations about a PG year or a post-grad year spent at a CTE center for students who perhaps were a little bit later on taking up the opportunities at a CTE center or for students who hadn't yet decided on what their path is going to be post-graduation. Post and uh, what thoughts do you have about that um, particular plan or model or idea? Thank you, and thanks for that question, raising that point. Um, 
I think there is kind of an emerging conversation around you know, what some are calling like a 13th year, um, you know, kind of that transitional year. Um, there are some states that are putting policy into place. I don't have uh, any examples off the top of my head, but I'm happy to pull them up because um, I know I have some colleagues at ECS who are actually looking and working on that, um, that policy issue and how states are approaching that. So I'm happy to connect with them uh, after this um, session and, and provide follow-up on that. Um, you know, states that are doing that, that kind of foundational information that may be helpful and informative. Thanks. Representative Austin? Yep. Do you have a name of a school in Maryland that you, you know, we could go look at their website that is incorporating kind of uh, younger grades in CTE instruction? Or could you get that to us, please? Um, we're happy to provide kind of state level. I'm not sure of any school, just then that's kind of more around the scope of our work, looks more at the state level uh, activity. So. Um, I can certainly provide some follow-up links to the State Department, which may give you some direction on, on schools. Um, and also, you know, as, as it's relevant, um, if we can make any connections to people in Maryland around specific issues, either at the Department of Ed uh, or in their legislature, however that may play out, that's most helpful to you. Um, we're also happy to make connections as we know those people in Maryland and, um, you know, kind of where your interests lie specifically, we're always happy to make those connections. And they may be able to then connect you to, to schools um, you know, where they see it you know, working well or that are kind of exemplars that they hold up when they support, when the State Department supports other districts in their work. Thank you. Vice Chair Kimball has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Tom, just a, a question. We've been hearing anecdotal evidence of um, a situation where some schools are introducing an old fashioned, uh, say industrial arts program, or maybe it's a STEM program, their local school, instead of having those students go to the career and technical education center. So, and then creating these dual costs and requirements for funding them. Uh, do you see that on a national level, uh, just looking at where CTE funding is and if that funding is also being required or requested for that primary and secondary school? Thank you for the question. Um, you, I think a lot of states, well, I'll say nationally, so when we look at it, states are organizing um, and really trying to align career pathways within their state. So I think as states and state departments support that activity, um, we see a heavy reliance on those career clusters and then the approval process of CTE programs. So usually that has some place-based determinant, right? So if it's at a high school or, you know, who's actually applying for program approval. So I, we see a lot of states relying on program approval as a way to organize that and align that within their state. So I don't have any specific ex examples of states that are doing what you outlined. You know, however, you have different state approval processes are generally the reliance for that. And then I think also, you know, once the approval process goes through, those are the programs that are funded and supported you know, for quality CT instruction. So I think as states rely on those systems, they help mitigate some of those other avenues that schools and districts may take uh, within their state. So, you know, I would just encourage the understanding of reliance of the CT approval process and how that may direct both instruction and then subsequent support and financial resources to, to support that in the state. So, um, you know, no concrete examples that I have of the uh, kind of you know, position you outlined, but um, generally that's what we see in our research and looking at states of how they organize, support, and then fund uh, CTE programs. Okay, thank you. Representative Conlon. Uh, thanks, Tom. Did you, uh, I'm just curious about adult CTE or, you know, what goes on in the evening and weekends. I don't know if you studied that at all. Vermont's funding method is essentially they offer courses, take in tuition funding, and that's what funds it. Do other states use a, a, a completely different model anywhere for the adult CTE programs? So I think that's a common approach for adult CTE. So just for context, in the information I provided, that analysis solely looked at secondary CTE, but we do also track legislation and policy in action around um, adult CTE, which we classify kind of in our workforce development work. Um, 
but yes, I think CT states that have CT centers leverage those for adult instruction and then tuition support for that. And I also think states are thinking about other uh, resources at their disposal to provide that type of instruction to support the administration instruction of that in addition to tuition. So if that's pulling in, you know, workforce and innovation uh, and Opportunity Act dollars at the federal level to support that, um, depending on the type of training that's being provided, right? So the range of CTE that's being provided, if it's CTE specific, or if there's some adult basic education involved in that, which includes some CTE instruction, we see states thinking about that and leveraging, you know, CTE centers in some cases or post-secondary institutions, you know, community or technical colleges to support that as well. So um, I think a long way of saying yes, you know, states are thinking about and using leveraging CT centers for adult, you know, CT instruction, um, whether they're, you know, and also regard their, the adult that may arrive there too may have different educational paths, right? They may, um, you know, seek uh, high school diploma uh, or equivalency as part of that too. I think states have thought about concentrating those types of programs along with career skills as part of adult education and CT centers um, as well. So I just wanted to add that as just kind of another thought that states are considering and leveraging uh, you have CT centers to possibly offer that type of instruction. Not seeing further questions in, in our room. Um, <laughs> I don't see any other questions here either. Okay, thank you. We do have um, one question because um, we're, I know that there's that we don't have the budget request at this point from ECS. So just wanted to reach out and I've forgotten what it is that you actually look for from states, small states like ours. <laughs> sure, I can speak to that very quickly. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, uh, so. For the, I, we did send ahead um, a, a very brief document called ECS Supports and Services. So um, I won't go into too much detail there, but essentially ECS was formed as a compact between all 50 states um, in the 1960s to help support states um, in the face of growing federal legislation around education and education policy. And so Basically, what we are is a membership organization for states to learn from each other, um, to collaborate and to share. We try to give voice to the diverse interests um, of the states themselves um, in the area of education policy. And so the way our dues structure works is we're not dependent on federal funds <clears throat> or any kind of national foundation funds. And it allows us to be nonpartisan and non-biased, as Tom mentioned. Vermont is a smaller state based on both its K-12 population and its GDP. And that's how the dues are set. So the dues are currently set at 53,100 for the state of Vermont. Um, this enables the state to access the full range of services that ECS provides, as well as officially appoint um, commissioners to um, the compact itself. That said, we have never turned a state away, as you can tell. Um, Vermont has actually been quite active with ECS in the recent past. Um, in addition to the support we're hoping to lend to you today through um, our, our presentation on CTE, um, we also have had engagement with the Agency of Education in Vermont in three recent technical assistance activities, one on STEAM education, one on P3 STEAM policy, um, and then a multi-state teacher licensing collaborative. Um, and so basically what ECS is trying to do there with technical assistance is bring states together on these specific topics, learn from each other, talk about challenges, and then have ECS policy experts there to help um, inform additional models or things like that. As you mentioned, as you noticed, Tom is reticent to say who's the best or who's doing the right thing. And that's partly because we do try to be non-biased, non-partisan, but we're always um, wanting and willing to make connections between states um, or identify models we think are applicable to the state of Vermont. So um, 
another activity that Vermont took advantage of is uh, um, our support of task, task forces. So we did support the task force on pupil waiting. Um, and that was just recently, I believe last year. Um, and so those are the, uh, some of the other things we do around council activities. So trying to lend our expertise when, when needed, um, when, you have got a, when you have a special topic um, in mind. So with that, I will pause and see if anyone has any questions about how ECS works or its dues model or, or its supports and services for that matter. <laughs> Representative James. Thank you. I, um, thanks so much for that. I just wanted to um, to thank you for sending along the PDF that showed all of the all of the support you provided to Vermont. Um, I, I just wrote you back like five minutes ago to ask if it's possible to update it with some of the more recent activities. I think the one I have is dated from November, but I just wanted to confirm. I, I think I'm correct in that Vermont has been taking advantage of your support and services, but we're, we've either lapsed in our payment or not made it for some number of years. And so I wondered if you could give us a little update on that. Um, I get the feeling we're like the people who listen to NPR and never chip in. <laughs> <laughs> I love that reference. Um, <laughs> um, so back in the 60s, all 50 states adopted um, the compact language into their um, statutes. Um, over time, with cleanups of statutes and simplification of statutes, some states have repealed language. So the state of Vermont repealed the compact language in 1995. Um, and at that point in time, stopped paying the dues, I assume, because there was no way to attach a fiscal note um, or a budget request to something that was no longer in statute. So um, essentially, I believe since 1995, I can double check, um, the state hasn't been paying the dues. Um, again, we do honor um, you all as a state of the, of the compact regardless, but I do think um, when we're looking at um, trying to prioritize resources, it's, it's, it is off, uh, awfully difficult to then, um, you know, have all the states kind of opt out of paying. So, <laughs> so yes, MPR might be a good example. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. We'll look into that. I'm seeing no more questions here. Oh, actually, I'll ask a, a very oh, quick one. One more question. Uh, on the same topic, uh, was it, um, uh, ECS who provided uh, testimony this summer or fall on the different delivery systems for um, English as a second language instruction. I'm getting a nod from my fellow committee member on the pupil waiting task force. I, but I think it may have even been Tom who delivered that to us. And special ed, I think. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you? So I will have to check with my uh, my team. I just started in May, so it may have preceded me, um, but we can look into that, or I can look to see if it was on the report that we provided, Representative James. Okay. Thank you. I know we've had a conversation, Aaron, about um, uh, work for teacher workforce as, as well. Um, I might want to follow up with you later on that. I know that there are some other states are using some innovative approaches. I believe one is paying mortgage <laughs> mortgages. I think one of the states was doing that, which is fabulous. Um, I will follow up with you on that. And I think that we're finished at this end. Representative Burkett. No other questions, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you so very much. Um, this has been helpful as we work our way through this. I, I just, just one other thing, are there, are there, I always do this, I'm sorry, as we're about to end, I think of my last question. Um, are, is there activity going on around the country in the way that people are looking at their CTE centers right now? Is that something that we're seeing? So we, we're, we have an increased interest in all of a sudden in looking at this. Is this something that other states are looking at right now? Is, is, it, is it a common topic of conversation or is it just kind of in little spots around the country? Um, Madam Chair, 
No, it's not in pockets. I think a lot of states are are thinking about CTE and CTE oh. delivery and kind of also thinking about where that fits within a broader kind of concept of, of workforce and education training as, a, as an individual you know, grows throughout their K-12 and you know, may interact with the post-secondary system or workforce training systems and how CTE aligns to those opportunities and helps support students in those growth. So I think, no, you're not alone uh, in Vermont in that way. Um, and it's help, as it's helpful as you kind of define and kind of set your direction, um, we're always happy to draw on state examples that may be considering on, you know, similar questions or have considered similar questions in the past. Um, and also, you know, kind of to Aaron's point, we're always happy to connect you with those states, but we're also happy to provide kind of any research kind of top level information as well, if there's any specific states too. Our, our current bill will be looking to for someone to help uh, t take a really take a look and make recommendations. If you have any any people around the country that you think might be uh, of uh, help to us, um, that'd be Russia. great if you could just email me. Yes, absolutely. We'd be happy to do that. Thank you so much. Madam Chair, as a follow-up to that too, I did write down some of these questions where Tom said we could get back to you. And so we will follow up with um, some written information request responses to you all. Okay, thank you so much. And with that, we can end this conversation and we will be continuing to look at our bill and we'll keep, we'll keep our, um, Keep our house commerce and economic development apprised to where we are with that bill. Thank you very much. So we can we can end here. We are back on the floor in an hour. Awesome. Great. Are we off? Thank you all. Okay, thank you. Thank Thanks. you for Okay. Um, with this in mind, are there any further thoughts we have about our current bill? We're speaking specifically of the $180,000 study bill. Yes. Okay. Right, exactly. Um, uh, yeah, I. I mean, I'm, we've got markup and possible votes scheduled for tomorrow. I feel, I feel good about that. Unless folks are having reservations, I'd, I'd love to move that along because I think it. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what Chair Marcotte said. Do they feel like they want to take a drive by? Drive by. Okay. Yeah. And then you said then ways and means and then approves. Yeah. So I feel like we need to get this roll. I'll get that. I'll get that order sorted out. I think it would be ways and means first and then approves, but. Um... Okay. They may have additional questions to ask. Since Either way, it's three stops. So yeah. no, two stops. One will just be they can they can they can just look at it without without taking possession of the bill. Okay. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. Okay. So we will plan on um, just have a moment to take a look at that. We'll do one last run through and then we'll vote. Okay. So how tied is this bill to advance Vermont? I mean, in my mind, it's, but yeah. Okay. Advance Vermont, one, I'm going to move that today. Okay. That's going to go straight up to Commerce and let them deal with it. Um, it. It just looked like most of the impact was happening more in the Department of Labor. Yep. Um, other than AOE providing some statistics. Um, seemed like it was, a, they were the ones that were going to be affected so yeah is it is it superfluous in that it's already covered by DOL I don't know so we'll, we'll let them sort that out anything else okay we can <coughs> break unless there's anything else anybody wanted to bring up related to any topic within our jurisdiction. <laughs> I have one. I don't know if we need to be on for this, but it's related to the Act 1 group. Yes, it's okay. Definitely. Um, it seems clear that we're going to need to put in uh, into a bill somewhere an extension because they were supposed to be done by the end of FY22. Right. And they're going to go until December. 
Right. So their stipends have been pulled back. Right. So a extension of their work until FY23 so that they can. Until December. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that will go into our letter. Okay. That they can just handle that in. Um, the, the legislative language part, we don't need to. We, we, we can state that. Um, okay. why we're doing this. We'll let them know why they need to do that. And then we don't need a separate bill out of committee to do that. Okay. And we don't need to stick the language in another bill? No. Okay. Because I think we extended it last year to December 22nd. We just didn't, if I remember correctly, we extended them, but we didn't appropriate funds in the next, in the next um, budget session. So in going back and forth with Amanda just now, um, and she copied me on emails with AOE. Um, it, the law states that the Work Act one would be concluded by July 2022. Budget management, not AOE, AOE took the stipend funding out to comply mm -hmm. with the law the way the law is written. And again, this is AOE. I guess you could ask the General, General Assembly for a new date for conclusion of the work. Have they written that into a bill for FY23? Okay. Okay. So we didn't extend. We didn't extend it last year. We just extended it to July. I guess. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll figure that out. Yeah. Would that go in the budget? That could just go in the budget. I think it could just go in the budget. Um, they have a place for language in the budget yeah. as well. Because it is also necessary because their fifty thousand for the consultant yeah. is in the RFP process now. It will be well That's underway last, yeah. by July, but it may not be done by July. So then they would have a problem finishing the payment. Okay. Let's. You can sort out that yep. what's needed, yep. and we will uh, talk with the Ledge Council okay. uh, on that. So what's the scope of the work of the consultant? Um, the standards, the contents, the, uh, I gotta go back to Amanda's testimony, but I think it's to help them parse through the standards. And the Department of Ed, I mean, the agency wasn't able to help them with that? I think it was always intended that that would be done with, they would do it and, and would need likely a consultant to help handle it because there's so many standards. And they agreed to the consultant in AOE agreed to Yeah, that. I think yes. they preferred that. So they did. Yeah. Okay. I feel like that flowed out of that conversation about San Francisco State, you know, remember yes. all of that? Yeah. 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 Said none of that one. Yeah. Yes. All right. So let's have a conversation about the budget items then that we're addressing. Okay. Right now, Jenna and Aaron are taking this on in a big way while Representative Conlon is a bit distracted by something. I can read it to you. Do you want me to go through the list that we have, we're working off of right now? Yeah, I was gonna just pull up the budget book in the meantime. Um, but yes, let's Most of this the list. is because Robin has already flagged it for us, but we're trying to figure out what else we need to look for. Yep. <laughs> we know the big one from AOE is the justification on positions. There are two new positions from the general fund yep. that they talked about already and that there is some explanation of in the budget book, yep. but there are five other positions being added, paid for by federal funds, but intended to become permanent positions. And so not sure what the budget implication of that would be. And in the chart that Robin somehow got next to all of those, it says we'll need to increase the cap. I'm not sure what that means either. Thank you. Those are all. So these, let's get these questions organized because the secretary is going to. Yep, I'm making a list. Right. Yeah. And um, we're getting, <laughs> getting one of them in. Um, Amanda, do we do we have? You're working on bringing someone in to talk budget with us, correct? That be yes, I am. The secretary or deputy secretary really are the ones we need to speak to. Is that yes. so? Tomorrow we have uh, Secretary French coming in to speak about chapter 11, um, right. but next Tuesday, I'm working with Maureen and Suzanne from AOE to get someone in to talk to us about the budget. Right. 
So can I just ask, do you want to keep going through the list? I, yeah. How, how do you want to handle this? Sure. Go ahead. Um, just, you know, before COVID, um, I think we had been hearing from schools about lack of professional development training from AOE on proficiency-based report cards, as well as this year we heard um, from schools the lack of professional development on MTSS. And I'm just wondering, are those two positions like that has- That will have nothing to do with it. Because there, those two positions, the two general fund positions are one, the uh, facilities position, which I think we would support. <laughs> if we wanted to do all that facilities work and that presentation we had, there's a real need for that. The second position is the communications team and, and sort of a response to COVID and how much their work has become communications and needing to grow that capacity. That one may be a more. Also worth remembering that uh, there are 11 vacant positions, right. seven of which are under active recruitment. So addressing those, they may exist, but don't have bodies. Maybe anymore. could we ask um, Secretary French when he comes when maybe we're talking budget, like an update on that? Sure. The other five positions that are, it says federal funds, but to become permanent and therefore need to increase the cap. Again, I don't understand what that means. Uh, three or four of them are uh, monitoring for special education. Or mon so I don't, we can ask what those positions entail more. One is a consultant for administering COVID funds and programs that goes away. Yeah. You said COVID funds, I would imagine. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think these are all COVID federal funds they're yeah. using. It's just that they're permanent positions. So how that fits into the, what they have <laughs> that's in the pipeline. I'll go back to the, so the other, the other positions are for essentially managing federal funds We need more people doing that. So, and so therefore it's funded by those federal funds. Um, I guess I would like to know why we need more people doing that. Does that mean that we have more federal funds, non-COVID federal funds coming in? Right. And are they permanent positions? Yes, yeah, so they're permanent positions and one is a grants manager and three are special ed monitoring. So I don't know if those are. No, it's really more. I don't know that those are COVID really. So I think that that's where there's questions. Yeah. So those are the big questions for the AOE. Um, the other question for AOE is there's apparently a proposal to waive licensing fees that come from uh, OPR for people under 25. I think all licenses, but the way they put it in the governor's recommend has it under education. So there's a, something, a probe has to clean up because there's a lot of things that get licensed, but it would include initial teacher licensure. And they have it as a $75,000 um, expense but Robin had some further information that estimated it would actually be at least double that to, to waive those fees um, for a year. And Robin suggested we need more, Representative uh, Shai recommended we need more information about like, what's the goal here? Is this part of the governor's workforce agenda, attracting young people? What's the goal? How will we know? Right. right. Why? Right. We've had a fee bill every year. Um, at least when I was the first, we have a fee bill and at different agencies, departments would put forth fees. So it might be your driver's license yeah. fee. It might be your permitting fee for something. It might be a will driller fee. All of those things help to cover that program. Right. But we have not had a fee bill since, um, since, since Governor um, Scott mm. came. He sort of has done away with that. So I don't know. This is an interesting one. So here's one where he's getting rid of a fee. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know if it's related or not. Okay. I don't know if it's just a workforce development. Okay. okay. But it would, we do need to get that. So and you've got this on the list. So that's on the list. Um, Representative Shai said that we need to get a little bit more from the AOE about in the governor's recommend. Um, there's a big list of one time expenses, um, one time expenditure from the general fund, and we've got 675000 go to AOE for um, the nutrition specialist to continue funding for the nutrition specialist. Right, right. 
and um, grants for school districts to purchase local foods. If, I, if I'm remembering correctly, the nutritionist was in the in the um, community's schools bill. Mm -hmm. And I think it was meant to be an ongoing position. Do folks remember that? Supposed to be an ongoing position or not? I don't know. Look, 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 look. <laughs> okay, so we'll have to check that. So there's that. There's this Act 1 date issue. Mm -hmm. yep. And then there's whatever, Janet, I don't know yet. <laughs> we don't know, but we know. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find out more. <laughs> I'll have a lot of Google Docs for next year. I'll be ready for this. <laughs> oh, and then we have, I guess, the whole committee might not have heard, but Jana organized a list of testimony that we need to officially be on the record. We don't have the Vermont State College's budget request right. in a formal sense. Apparently, perhaps does, but we have not. And VSAC. Uh, and VSAC. Do you talk to Peter? Peter, mention anything about the colleges? Huh? Peter, thank you. Did I what? About budget requests? Yeah. I, about state colleges? They've presented to approach, but not to us yet. Okay. And Peter sent in some questions, and they've they've responded to his questions in, in email. So, but we just haven't heard from him yet. Where does the community college of Vermont fit in? They're in the Vermont State College. They, they are? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. part of the merger. Interesting. Okay. Maybe if they keep, I think they're still- They're, they're still a separate, separate entity, separate. CCV, but they're under right. the- They're part of the that's corporation. Was, yes. <laughs> that's what you're thinking of, Sarita. The, the VSC oh, transformation right. is gonna merge the residential colleges gotcha. into yeah. Vermont State University. CCV is gonna stay yep. under the corporation, but they're going to continue to function independently. And the funding uh, goes to um, Vermont State Colleges and CCV. Yeah, when we do an appropriation, it goes to all of them. Thank you. Uh -huh. Does it go separately? I don't think so. It just goes to the corporation. Yeah. And then it, they float it. We already got UVM's request, so we have that. And we know there's a yeah. ask for a big increase or an increase. <laughs> editorial okay so amanda's working on getting testimony in you to organize that question that we can submit to them would be great um i i simply thank you for this work well let's wait and see <laughs> you you've so far done way more than i have done so i'm most appreciative Oh, and it's due Wednesday. <laughs> due Wednesday, by the way. I'm assuming that's a hard deadline, not a squishy deadline. It's a good 24 hours squishy deadline. <laughs> now we're talking like students. Do you mean it's due at midnight on that day? Or is it Five. due by class time? <laughs> Those details are important. Yeah. Okay. So. That's great. You just copy. Yeah. Great. You want to be copied, or you want to be left off? I'm okay being. Left off. <laughs> yeah. Then my head gets out of chapter eleven. Yeah. 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 So you want me to put the Act One, like needs the put, into an email. That would be great. Just to you. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Okay. Into a okay. into a document of some kind, whether it's email or a Word doc. I don't. Okay. Think okay. Fine. Okay. Um. Just so that we've got it written. And then when AOE is in, I'll ask them yes. as well to we'll submit get that on the record. Some, some questions to them to have them prepare for that. And if we can get that off before the weekend, that would be great. Okay. Uh, okay. Whatever we can get done before the weekend would be great. Okay. So we're basically, where are we coming down here? We don't have anything After left before. for today. Okay. Tomorrow, oh, look at that sneaky ad for tomorrow. tomorrow we will look oh, that's right. at voting out 483. Oh. <laughs> oh, both. Possibly voting that out tomorrow. Yeah. Um, 
without the permission of the chair or discussing it with a single member of this committee, I have scheduled testimony on chapter 11 for after lunch at 1 p.m. I just saw that. Thank you. <laughs> Very sneaky. We'll try, we'll try to limit it to one. <laughs> and what we really need to do is just, um, we're really, we're, we're very close. Yeah. We just got to uh, deal with the last stuff that we were talking about. They all have the language by 8.30 in the morning. Um, and have you spoken to, to um, the superintendent's uh, school board? Uh, no, because the superintendents are at a convention. And that will, so we'll have to look for some testimony next week. Yeah. Um, yeah, we got a lot of the budget stuff now. And that's like, We've got a lot to squeeze together here. That's that one tomorrow, you said? Yes. I would like to, if we can pull it together, get it close to pulling together if we can, and send what we can to, Perfect. to those, those guys. And that will be a drive by. They do not want possession of that. And then we won't send it to the clerk until after we have returned. Is that? Um, I can, we can either vote it out on Friday, um, we can vote it out next week so that it's on the floor on Tuesday, or we can vote it out um, on Friday so it's on notice on Tuesday. We'll Tuesday following our break. Yeah. Tuesday let's, following let's, let's, let's sort of think or, of or do we want to Yeah, yeah. I think. <laughs> I think that's right. Yeah, it must be on the other side. I had found like some kind of draft. Yeah, so just like, yeah, it's like the table of contents. Right. These are just the highlights. I guess. Yeah. And then I just, 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 well, there is the possibility that we're going to vote out 483. We could. That case. Um, oh, yeah, here we go. Are you still? But that's after the fine. Maybe that's mine, yeah. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's yes. fine. But I have a 9 o'clock meeting, so I can't. No, eat, eight, I don't want to miss it. 830 to 930 is just. Eight, 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 so you don't have to. I'll be here for a bit, and then I'll. I think it's just about. All right, thank you. Thank you. You can take mine. Sure. Okay. I like it. I love it. Seven gone. We've got.